good. So now the recording is on and uh, we will uh, continue our class. So, notation for as well. Uh, good. So, uh, let me also maybe increase a little bit. So can you read it? Actually, one other thing, if you can move a little bit to the center, that would be better than going to the back of the class, maybe from next time. Uh, just come with this area. Great, uh, so having said that, let's go and, uh, and these are the hand, uh, uh, these are my handwritten notes. I feel a bit more comfortable doing that because I'm writing also some handwriting here, but there are the type versions of that. This is the LaTeX version, PDF version that you can read them. And also, I mean, you can read the book of this. Some places will go beyond the book, but uh, uh, these are the places that are in the book. Uh, great. And as we mentioned, we are discussing, I mean, these are the type of problem that you need to, I mean, know more about them. These are like the three key problem. All of them, uh, I mean, they have this one that you will see actually is this type of like lead code or I don't know, hacker rank, geek for geeks. These are the type of problem that you will see the first view that you have the problem. It may make it hard if you want to do that. You really need to come back and then tell maybe I can think a little bit and then come back from another view and then you will solve it. And uh, it is very important that the first view that you have it. If you do that, maybe the implementation of that would be hard. The running time would be essentially too much. And that's not the right solution. And lots of people may try this one and that's the wrong way. You always, it's better to don't do it right away. Think about it maybe for five minutes, 10 minutes, what you should do. Then you will find the solution. Then you will do it and the coding would be much easier. That typically also happens in the interviews that you have with this kind of coding interview. And you will see the examples here during this class. Good. Uh, so here, uh, let's start with this one. Uh, you want to prove this inequality. You want to say one half plus one fourth plus one over eight to uh, plus one over two to the n is less than one. Good. And you want to use essentially the induction. So here, uh, the question is that, uh, how can you prove it for this one? Because uh, what is the issue? The issue is that you may say that, okay, this one half plus one is two. So what would be the induction hypothesis? The induction hypothesis, of course, when n is equal to one, what will happen? Actually, let me just do this one. Just one. Hmm. Good. Yeah. So if you want to do it for induction, of course, uh, n uh, like one over two to the one, that is, uh, so that is less than one. So if n equal to one is like the base is the induction, the base is, is. now assume that we want to say that what is the induction hype of? Is that like, uh, this is less than one. You want to say that if you are adding a uh, one over two to the N plus one to this side, 
So if you are just doing this addition of this, still it is less than one. Good. So this does not work like that because you are adding one over two to the n plus one to one side, but not the other side. So this is not a typical induction that you can get. So that's the part that you need to, again, see that is a different view that you need to have. How can we solve it? Let's do this one. Uh, so the trick is to use the induction in a different order. <laughs> Consider now the last n terms. So here, uh, now when you have essentially, so what is the thing that you have it? You have one half plus one fourth plus one fourth. Good. Uh, so this is a term that you want to do. It. Let's ignore for now one half. Start from these guys. Good. So I'm just ignoring the first one half. Now, if I do this one, then I can, uh, this is the thing. No, I can factor one half out of it. Good. What would be the sum would be one half plus one fourth to one over two to the n. Good. Here, that's the part that I can, but this is the part that I can use the induction from for that. This is the basis of, this is, that would be the induction hypothesis. to induction hypothesis. So uh, here, the theorem itself is somehow induction hypothesis. And here I can use the induction, like uh, this is what the trick. I will just ignore the first one half, then I factor out the first one half, then I have these guys, correct? Now, uh, I know that this guy by induction hypothesis, this is, this is exactly this one. So this would be less than one. It means that one half times this would be less than one half, correct? The only remaining term that it remains is this one half that I have ignored it. I know that this term, the remaining term is less than one half. This is one half. So I will just add both to both sides one half. This becomes the, the statement that I wanted to get for n plus one. This guy becomes one half plus one half, which is one, which is less. Does it make sense? Can you see the last part again? So, uh, so, so uh, uh, here, uh, uh, from the induction hypothesis, I knew that this is less than one, correct? So this one half times this would be less than one half. So now, uh, uh, like, what did they want to prove? So the, uh, this is what the induction hypothesis, one half plus, uh, like, one fourth to one over two to the n, less than one. However, I, what do I want to prove? This is the induction hypothesis. I want to say that one half plus one fourth plus one eighth uh, to plus one over two to the n plus one over two to the n plus one. So I have everything here except this one half that I ignored. So to both sides, if I add, and now I have everything except this one. Now I will add one half to this one. That would be exactly the induction hypothesis. And I will add one half to this part as well, which is that would becomes equal to one, correct? Right? So it means that the original things, is less than one. That's exactly it. Okay. Clear? Yeah. This is a nice trick that this is exactly the view. If you want to do it in the wrong way, if you want to prove this one, you can you you can never prove it because one half then uh, plus if you add because it seems wrong that how come you you know that one half plus one fourth to one eighth plus one over two to the n is less than one, but you are adding this plus one over two to the n to this. Part, but you don't add anything to other one. So that, of course, potentially can go wrong because if you add to some parts of inequal, inequality and not to other one, you can violate it. Kaviola, uh, do you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Clear? Any questions? Good. Uh, so let me clear everything here. Let's go to the next example. <laughs> so 
So <clears throat> let's talk about this problem. What is this problem? So this is a uh, So this is the example that I have mentioned. Let's prove, talk about this. We say that if x1, x2 to xn are all positive numbers, then uh, this x1, x2, xn to the one over n is less than, so this is called geometric. Uh, mean and this one is called the uh, I mean regular mean or additive mean of these numbers so if you have x1 x2 xn then you can get multiplications of that so the one over n is called geometric mean and the other one is called uh, additive mean essentially and you want to say always the geometric is less than additive that's a uh, famous essential famous inequality good and if you remember i mentioned about some induction hypothesis before so i mentioned that one way is that you will go from one then you will go to two then you will go to three and so on and so forth good and so on and so forth uh, and so this is in some sense that I mentioned. So this is the regular induction. Then if you remember, I mentioned that for three, you, you can use both one and two. For four, for example, here, you may use three, you may use two as well, and you may use one. And the question was that whether you can reach any of these numbers or not. I mentioned that there are more advanced versions that maybe you will do this one. You are doing from one, then you will go to two, then you are going to four, then you will go to eight to 16. So first you are proving from these guys. And this you can prove it because these are all powers of, so these are all two to the i. So you can have induction on i. First you are proving for these guys, but there are some of the people who are left behind. What do you do when you prove it for eight, then you will come back and from them you are proving for others. But so this is a case that uh, we are using some kind of uh, uh, so in, in some sense here we are using uh, induction, but uh, like a different type of induction. And I mentioned really the the main thing that it matters is that you can reach any number somehow from the things that you have proved. Because induction, you will start from the base, from here. Then from one, you can go to two. From two, you can go to four. From four, you can go to eight. And then you can come back and then fill in the gaps. Because you are reaching, so somehow this statement reaches any number. So that means that it is proof. So this is a like more advanced way of uh, induction. Have you seen anything like this before? Any of you have you seen such thing before? Uh, okay, good. So yeah, uh, but I think the majority have not seen. So let's see this example. And that's uh, but this is a nice algorithmic way to see the induction that you are doing these operations and then you will come back and you are filling the gaps essentially. Uh, good. So uh, uh, now let's uh, talk about this one. So, I mean, it's, you can also say it like this one. So this I have mentioned it, but you can also read it from this one. So here, first uh, for in induction, so it is called also something, it is called the reverse induction principle. This reverse are this uh, back things that we are coming. But it's the general idea that if a statement P is true for an infinite subset of the natural numbers, so this infinite number it would be the powers of two that we are proving that. First, we are proving for the power of two, these are the infinite number. And then if we employ, then we say that also in, so first we need to prove that for the infinite number of uh, 
uh, numbers it holds. Uh, and this infinite is important because you know that for any number, there is one bigger than this guy. Then also we say that the, it, uh, the, if it, the truth for n implies the truth for n minus one, then p is true for all natural numbers. So it just says the same thing that we have mentioned. So it says that it should be an infinite number. What's the meaning of that? It means that if you consider any number, there should be one other number for which you have already proved it. These are like, for example, this 16. So let me just change the painting. So here, this is like, say first we are proving essentially for the blue guys. You know that if you consider any number, any red guys, either it is blue that we proved it for that, or it is red. But if it is red, there is one guy which is after that, which is blue. That comes because of the infinite now. Then when we have that one, then we have this additional thing that when you can go from n to n minus one. Then you can go from n to n minus one, all right? So uh, this is the second one. So if you know that it is the case, there is one number which is bigger than that and n implies n minus one, it means that it should work for everything. Because as I mentioned, you can reach every number by this induction hypothesis. It's like it, whole induction is like a, some algorithms for this particular graph. Uh, yeah, that's essentially the same thing that I have mentioned it here. There's one great number and then you can come back. Uh, so uh, like one good way to do that generally for the powers of two, because when you consider powers of two, then you can do the induction on I. So when I goes from one to two, then you, like from here, for example, if you have two to die, if goes, I goes from one to two, you will go from two to four. When I goes from two to three, you will go from four to eight and so on and so forth. Good. So let's see then an example for this. Uh, so uh, let's consider the thing. Let me clear everything. Uh, good. So uh, let's prove for this case. <laughs> let's start for n equal to one. So what do we what do we need to do? This is the base of induction. You need to prove this one for n equal to one. Correct. So if, if n equal to one, so this would be, you have only one number. X one to one over one would be just X one. And the other one, X one over one would be equal to X one. Good. So we have equality, which is of course less than or equal. So the base of induction is trivial. Now assume that, so now say that we are proving it. So this is the case. So we have proof for, so assume that this is correct for n equal to, two to the i. Now I want to say that I want to prove it for n prime, which is two, two to the i plus one. So I'm doing induction on, so I, for essentially, so n equal to one, by the way, was equivalent to, so n equal to one was equivalent to i equal to zero. Good, because two to the zero would be equal. Good, now let's uh, uh, see how can we prove that. So let's, I mean, if you want, sometime for the, as a basis of induction, you might actually try to do it for, just make sure that you are not missing very special cases. You may try for one or two. It's not necessary, but just if you want to do it for some sanity check. So for, for example, n equal to two, again, n equal to two would be equal to i equal to one. Because uh, we are assuming that we have this assumption. 
n is equal to two to die. Good. Now, what do we have here? Uh, say here we have uh, this one. This versus this. When we don't. So that that would be easy. You just make this one the power, make every, both sides to the power of two, and just do simple math. And then if you do the simple math, that turns out so you will get this one. Uh, this would be x1 plus x2 to the two. That would be four times x1 plus x2. Then you can write the whole equation is like this, x1 plus two plus this, that you can write it x1 minus x2 to the two. And whenever we have this equation, x1 minus x2 to the two, that we know that it is always greater. Because it's some number to the power of two. Great. Okay, so uh, so we proved it for the basis for i equal to zero and i equal to one. So here also what what for i equal to. Let's now prove it uh, more generally. Yes. Um, so are we doing induction i? Yes. Uh, I mean, you can do induction in anything that you want. So we do induction on i such that we can get, uh, so this infinite series of n. So that's the whole idea. Then from then we are doing induction. Then we say that if the segment goes for n, then it applies for n minus one as well. And then we get everything. Good. Now, uh, assuming this uh, one is, uh, so what is this one? This is, uh, so this is the induction. Uh, so just, this is a star. So this is the induction hypothesis. We want to prove this one uh, that, So maybe actually I can just write it here. So we have this. Can you do anything? Yeah. Uh, anyhow, uh, so. Uh, so uh, here, uh, so a star is this one. Just remember that x1 times x2 times xn to the one over n is less than or equal to x1 plus x2 to xn over n. Good. Now assume that it is correct for uh, some n, which is two to the k. So say that is correct for n equal to two to the k. Now I want to prove this one for two n, which is, Two to the k plus one. Yes. Before that, could you explain the inequality that we got above on that square? You mean this one? Yeah. Yeah. So just I mean, just I mean, make everything to the power of two. If you make everything to the power of two, then we know that that becomes like this, correct? Yeah. And then you will just rewrite this one, x1 plus x2 to the two. You just write this one, do the algebra, that would be this, and then would be for this. So you will just bring these guys from this side to this side, it becomes minus. It, it, so if this, would be, this would be x1 to, um, uh, to the two plus uh, x2 to the two, plus two times x1, correct? Yeah, okay. Then you have this minus four, you will bring it here, it becomes minus this. And then you can write this one as this, and then you will get it. Simple algebra. Uh, good. And I mean, algebras actually are important. Like we cannot do the program without algebra because that's the thing that we are getting. We are always using lots of algebra in CS, uh, especially when we want to prove, or even, I mean, like 
the places that we don't want to prove, like machine learning or other. That's still algebra plays a very important role. Algebra and probability. Good. Now, uh, so this is the, uh, so we have this uh, left. Uh, so now let's assume that that is correct. This star is correct for n equal to two to the k. We want to prove it for two n, which is two to the k plus. Good. So we want to go from here to here. Okay, so what do we write? We just write this one, x1, x2, x to the 2n, to the one over 2n, correct? That's the thing we want to do. So then <laughs> we want to show that this is less than x1, x2 to xn to the one over n. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, uh, like first we write this one. Now here we are using induction hypothesis, correct? Uh, yes. So uh, uh, here essentially is uh, one, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, what can we say here? So here we have x1, x2 to x2. So this is actually power of two here. So this is, so that we can just, this is equal to this one, correct? Because this is the power of one over two to the n. So here, this is x1, x2, xn to the power of, uh, to the power of one over n. And then here is power of one over two. So it would be one over n times one over two would be one over two n that we have it. So I'm just rewriting it. I didn't do anything. Now, this part calls this one uh, y1 and this part y2. Good. Here, actually, that is interesting. Here I am using. Uh, so, uh, so I know that uh, what is this one, x1, x2 to x2n to the one over 2n is, is equal to y1 times y2. And y1 essentially is this term, y2 is that. Clear so far? Any question? Tabiola, is it clear to you as well? Yep, I'm all good. Great. Okay, now let's do this one. Now here, actually, that's the one important thing. Here, this is a special case that we are using it for n equal to two, or i equal to one. So that was actually the reason that we needed to prove it also for n equal to directly. Because if we didn't prove it, then we couldn't go from one to two. Here we proved this one before for n equal to two, so now we can use it. So sometime, I mean, this is like as I mentioned, the combination. So when you go from here, maybe for the first guy for n equal to one, we prove it. So here we, for n equal to one, we proved it, then we have proved it uh, for n equal to two and so on. So you, it might be the case for the first two guys, you prove it and then for n equal to four, you may essentially try to use the induction. It is a combination. So in some sense, as long as this graph that I have mentioned, you can go from zero to everywhere, then you are fine. Good. So here we already proved it for n equal to two because if we didn't prove this one directly for n equal to two, then we had a problem here. We couldn't go from i equal to zero to i equal to one or from n equal to one to n equal to two. We couldn't do that. But we already proved this one here, so we are safe. Now uh, here we have this. This guy is equal to y one times y two. This is less than y one. Okay. So here I'm just using for the n equal to two. I knew that SQL root of y1 plus y2 is less than or equal to y1 plus y2 over two, correct? Now, here I'm using the induction hypothesis. So here IH means induction hypothesis. Now, uh, uh, so, so uh, here, what do I do for y1? What was y1? y1 was x1, x2, to xn to the one over n, correct? I can use induction hypothesis. By induction hypothesis, I know that this is less than or equal to x1 plus x2 plus xn over n. Good. 
that's why I'm so from here to here, I'm just using induction hypothesis. Similarly, from y2, I can write it down. So y2, what was y2? Xn plus one, xn plus two, and to x to two and two is one over n. So I can, by induction hypothesis, I know that this geometric uh, uh, average, essentially, uh, this geometric average is uh, less than the additive average. So I will just replace that one. And then I had it over two, correct? This is the over two that I'm also putting it here. Good. Now we are done because this is n, this is n. So it would be x1 plus x2 plus xn plus xn plus one to this one to x2 to 2n. What would be the denominator would be two times. That. That's it. So we could prove this one is less than equal to this one as we want. So that was very easy actually to go. So we have used two things. Somehow we have used induction hypothesis twice. We have used it for n equal to two here. And we have used another induction hypothesis to get this result. Is it clear? Yes. No question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, at the start of the program, how did you recognize you know, that n equals so the, the, the uh, So you mean this line here? Yeah, like at the beginning, like how did you recognize you know, that n equals so the of that inductive? Yeah, so, so, yes, I think here, in some sense, if you try to do that, you will reach here. So to reach here, I mean, you say, oh, I cannot prove that because I need this one. So in that case, you will go and prove it directly, and then you are. See, that's the way that attention. Sometimes this happens that I mean, you essentially for any when you go to that the beginning here we use I mean some complicated things because to prove this guy, as I mentioned, you can use anything between like before that, including the two. But here, for the case of two, you couldn't do that because uh, there was nothing there. You, you need to sometimes prove it directly and then it. But you didn't need to prove it, for example, for three or four or something, because that's that's enough. So for n equal to one, n equal to two, that's enough. Questions? So let's, we have now proved it essentially for this power of, Two to die, we have proved. Now let me clean everything. <laughs> this clear button is the my favorite button because it's, it's one click, everything is done. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we are not done yet so far. So, uh, as I mentioned, so we could prove it. Uh, <coughs> so we could prove it here for one, two, four, eight, I don't know, <laughs> 16. But we need to prove now the in between guys. What about three here? What about five, six? Seven here and so on. So, so, so far we have used uh, this induction things to go from here to here to eight. Actually, for example, for eight we have also used two and so on. So, forth. and we could prove this one, but we need to come back. How can we do the comeback? So, when we want to come back, we want uh, that's the thing that we want to go from n to n minus one. Generally, this should be easy, correct? You want to, if you prove something for n, that you should go also, it should be correct for n minus one. Eh, because n is somehow more general than n. But you need to, I mean, still you need to have a formal proof. It does not necessarily say that. Because in particular here, we have proof for 
n, which are only powers of two. Good. So this is the thing that we are using this reverse induction here. So assume that a star, again, a star was the assumption that we had it before, that x1 plus x2 to this, the assumption that uh, this geometric average uh, is less than uh, the additive average. Say this is correct yeah. for n, and then from there, we want to get it for n minus one. So here we want to go from some, some from n, we want to go to n minus one. How can we do that? Let's, I mean, say we have the numbers. Uh, so what are the numbers that we have? So you want to, uh, the, the, for n minus one, you have n minus one numbers, correct? You don't have the xn. You only have x1 to xn minus one. You don't have xn because there are n numbers. We have n minus one number. So I need to create the nth number. How do I create it? That's the way. So let's define this z as the nth number. It would be x1 plus x2 plus xn minus one. These are the one that you have it over n minus one. Good. Now, we know that uh, this, uh, okay, now I'm using induction. I know that the induction is correct for n numbers. What are the n numbers? x1, x2, eta, xn minus one, and this z that I have defined it now. So z plays the role of n minus one. Somehow z is dependent to the other previous numbers. Then what do I have? So this is a just induction hypothesis. It knows that x1 times x2 times this guy times z to the one over n is less than x1 plus x2 plus xn minus one plus z over n. Good. Now, what do I do? Here, uh, so I, I have this one by induction hypothesis. So this is by induction hypothesis. Now, what can I do after that? Let's consider this V guy. But look, what was the thing? So I knew that Z is equal to this. It means that X1 plus X2 to X N minus one, this is less than or equal to what? Or like actually it's equal to what? It's equal to what? If you have this, this we have it. So from this, we know that x1 plus x2 to xn plus one, it, it is equal to what? n minus one times e. Correct? I just replace that one. So here I have the same terms. I just replace it with this. I had it z before as well. So I will just sum it up. So it is n minus one times z plus z over n, which is z. So I prove this one, x1 times x2 times z to the one over n is equal, is less than or equal to z. Now let's have this one. Let's have both of them to the power of n. So here it would be z would be z to the n. Here I have this guy to the one over n would be one over n times n would be one. Good. Now I have z here, z here. Let's cancel out this one. So it would be uh, here. Uh, so uh, so you have this one. So I can just cancel out this one with this one. So it would be this would be x one x two x n to the power of uh, z to the n minus one. <coughs> Correct? Now, what do I do? I just now did reverse it. I will take the power of one over n minus one from both sides. So here x1, x2 times xn minus one is less than or equal to z to the n minus one. This part would be x1, x2 to the, this to the power of one over n minus one. This part would be only z. But what was z by definition? x1 plus x2, xn minus one over n minus one. 
So I proved it that this guy is less than this guy. Exactly the one. Does it make sense? Yeah. Can you, I don't hear you well. Can you go back to how you got uh, the final equality from x1 to x minus 1 times g to both the negative? So you mean uh, which line here? The, the, yeah, from, from, from here? Yeah, yeah so, so so from here I had I mean I have just I mean so far I have proved this one correct this part so we, I'm just uh, explaining this part so I proved this one essentially from this one it is less than b correct then I uh, power both of them to the power of n good nothing else. so then I have I mean then I have one v here v to the n here I have just cancelled this v with the n minus one and you get an n minus one. Then I have done the reverse. So here I have the made both part to the power of n. Here I will make both part to the power of one over n minus one. Here only z remains. This part, this one to the one over n minus one. And then z is equal to this, I replace it in that. Clear? Any question? Good. Okay. So let's uh, clear everything. Now let's go to the another. So, so far we have done some equations, but now let's go to the program. So when we have a program, I mean, so if we want to prove a correctness of an algorithm. So we, how do we use the uh, like induction? Generally is the case that, I mean, the algorithm might be complicated. Me, Generally, we prove this one. Uh, I mean, if the program, if there is no loop in it, there is no for while or anything similar to that, then this is just a constant number of things. So generally induction probably is not working. You need to do all case analysis. The problem, the problem becomes in interesting when there is a parameter n and there is a, so when there is a parameter n, and you have some kind of while loop or for loop. So when we have a while or for loop, generally for for or while, for important parts, not again, for there are some trivial parts that we can do it and that we can, we don't need to prove it. For some important part, we need to uh, prove that this for is doing correct. This is the thing, uh, so, when we consider some kind of any uh, consider loop execution, we have some kind of induction hypothesis, which is in, in this case is actually called loop invariant. Loop invariant, essentially induction hypothesis that we try to prove for this. And generally, I mean, we are uh, doing this for important problems. Like for important part of the program, not for everything, because some of them, I mean, you need to write, you will check it. And again, if there is no for or while, generally it means that there is no nothing uh, non-trivial here. You have done some case analysis. But the problem is that there is an input n and this n, there is some for or while or something.
Good. Let's see the example here. <clears throat> so what do we want to do? Let's see an example. So we want to prove the somehow the loop invariant. <coughs> Let's see this uh, this simple algorithm. Convert an integer n to its binary representation. Good. So just an example. For example, if it is n equal to thirteen, then its binary representation would be one one zero one. So why? Because we have eight here, we have four here, and this is one. That would be 18, correct? That's a binary representation. So how do we want to represent it? So this is an array. So that, that's the way that we want to do it. So we have an array B, like the first things would be, the first bit goes there, second bit goes to the second, third bit goes to here, and the fourth bit goes to, and after that would be zero. Like B1 should be the le least significant bit when you represent this guy in binary. B2 would be the second least significant bit when you represent in binary and so on. Is it clear <laughs> the problem and how, how do we want to read? So this is essentially B1 or B0, it doesn't matter. So this is B1, this is an array, B1, B2. <laughs> One question uh, here, uh, how many of you are familiar? Uh, have you passed C++ course or C? Everyone passed. So what was the, what was the course number or? So and what was the name of the course? Oh, computer system. Everyone passed that course? Okay. okay. So, and they are teaching C and C++. C or C++? Just C. Oh, just C, okay. Just C is not enough. I think you need to do it C++. So one thing that I have mentioned actually is very important. This is C++, uh, I think 20. Uh, I think 20 means 2020, that's a release 2020. But uh, the one which is actually, I think the people more a standard one, I mean, maybe, that is also good. I mean, C plus plus eleven has changed a lot. So in sometimes C plus plus eleven changed a lot comparing to previous ones. But all of them, there are C plus plus fourteen or fifteen, and then C plus plus twenty. I think there is C plus plus twenty two or twenty three is coming as well. But uh, that's also the new version. But anyhow, so this C plus plus. Have you? How many of you know about STL? In C++. But did they teach in the course? Yeah. So, what is that? Yeah. So this is very important. This is STL is very important. If you want to go to software engineer to do any interview, etc., you need to know this STL quite well. What are these? These are some essentially new things that has been added. Uh, we will talk about them later in this course when we do it, uh, but uh, let me just see whether I can. Um, yeah, uh, let me bring it later uh, for this one. But here, this STL is very important because that actually it is. I think one of the interesting things that Python had this structure, C or C plus plus didn't had it. STL is the one that actually that has been added those things that they were in Python to C plus, and makes the life much much easier. What do they have? They have vector, they have mapping, they have uh, priority queues, they have set, multi-set. And these are the things that actually make the life much, much easier to work with. Otherwise, there is just simple array and if you want to do this array, not everything is hard. And the one other thing is that the fact that they are dynamic. It means that you don't, uh, actually the array is now also, you can do that. You don't need to say what is the size of the array. Before you need to say that you define an array, you need to say what is the size of this array. Unless if you want to use pointers in C++. There, there you could actually avoid it, but then pointer is not the 
I mean, still you need to work in C++ pointer. You cannot avoid pointers, but it some of this now you don't need actually pointers and you have this. So it still is very important. We will come back to it. I think that's you should learn it, and that's the core. That any interview you will go there. That's the thing that they will ask the question. If you want to put do it in C or C++, that actually for software engineers is still like, for example, Google or. Uh, I mean, some other companies like hedge funds or other, they are actually asking C++ because that's faster things comparing to Python. And anyhow, one other interesting thing that I mentioned that binding that if, how many of you know Python? Okay, yeah, Python is good, but I mean, Python is also not a simple language. I think that people may, you can write very easily something there, but if you know all the possibilities of the things that you can do it at Python, that's actually complicated language. C++ was a complicated language. Then uh, Python came and got some of these ideas, especially object-oriented things from things, and then changed some of this, like this concept of decorators or something like this is a bit, I mean, maybe, or like a, a wrapper, these type of things came more in the Python things. And then some of them also, also some convenience like sets, multi-sets, uh, all of these dictionaries, which is essentially a mapping, all of them now from Python went to actually C++. So I will say at some point, all these languages will convert to something. However, C++ is a still faster language. And some part of Python like NumPy or Pandas or others, they are written in C++. And actually, you can do this one as well. So you can write this one. This is called binding. You can bind <laughs> Python and C++. For some part that you want to do faster algorithms, you can actually write it. Like I think there is a network uh, X, <laughs> that's a module that you can use it in Python for network or graphs that we will talk more about it. There, uh, these, these are, I believe these are also written in like C++ and then bind it with Python. So that's, I think these two languages, if you know them and you can use both of them, that would be very powerful because they are somehow end of the spectrums. Python is like very uh, handy for the text stuff. C++ is very fast and there is Java in between and JavaScript after that. These are all in the same ranges from C++ to Python. So anyhow, this STL is some of the things that you can use it and that would be very useful. Uh, good, so let me see whether we can uh, finish this one. Okay, so what is the algorithm that we have here? We have this algorithm, you convert this N, given N to a binary and the binary should be this array. I mean, this array actually you can use it as a vector now and then in the using STL in C++. <laughs> and you do, uh, represent this one. So in some sense, you don't need this zero anymore because the, the size of this array, it can be dynamic, it can be size four. Okay, so N is given to you and then uh, B is an output uh, array of bits corresponding to the binary representation of N, such that the least significant bit would be the first element of the array or the vector. So we use vector or array interchangeably essentially in C++. Now, uh, this is the algorithm. So uh, let n be called, uh, let's t, t is the integer variable, a new variable t that preserves n. So actually it is interesting. So in the C++, if you use it, you can say int of, uh, you need to introduce it. You can say int of t, or uh, if you use it, that's also very nice things. It is called auto. Nowadays they are using the people. This is more Pythonian type of thing that they are using it. So when you put auto, it means that the compiler should find the type of this from itself. You don't say which things, you should find it. This is exactly the fact that in Python, we don't have any type generally. And the compiler once finds it or interpreter finds it. Anyhow, so you will say this is the, so this is the term variable t is equal to n, is a new variable to preserve n. k is equal to zero. What does it do? It says that while t is greater than zero, k is equal to k plus one. It means that go to the next uh, bit, the next least significant bit. Bk is equal to t mod two. Mod in C++ would be percentile. In uh, Python would be mod. 
and then t is equal to t over uh, div of t. div is just, I mean, this a slash. Correct, this is a slash, correct? Not like a slash. Confusing one. So uh, this is the whole algorithm, essentially. Good. So that's the whole algorithm. That oh, and one last thing that we need to have it also here is that t is equal to t. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that t is equal to. So uh, what does it do? So this is essentially a t. t is equal to n at any time. This while what does it do? While t is greater than zero, it adds one. It try to find the next least significant bit. Okay. Then the, that would be t mod two would be that bit. And then it divides it by two to find the other bits. That's all I'll do. Yes? Shouldn't it add decay after it does the division in the Because otherwise you're not going to put into Yeah, I mean, it depends on whether you want to k start from zero or one. So here, like if you want to, this is like, again, what is the first element of the array? Is it b0 or b1? It'll be zero. Yeah, I mean, but you can have it be one actually. Something like Pascal or others, you can have it be one. But yeah, that's up to you. You can this, you can move it here. That's not important. Here, I mean, I put it this one. We just prove it for this one for B K, uh, like B one, B two. B one would be the first, the first uh, least significant bit. That's the thing that maybe it's more convenient. Good. Now, uh, what do we want to prove? We want to say that this algorithm converts to binary terminates, and it gives the binary representation of n stored in the analytic B. That's the one that we want to prove it. Clear? Of course, this is an algorithm. I mean, how can we prove that it works? So let's, that's the part that from this statement, this is a very general theorem. That's actually, we will see this one in the papers that are published. This algorithm obtains this correctly, representation of n bits. But so far, there is no induction. To make the induction, as I mentioned, there are some of these that are trivial. I don't prove anything about this part or this part. These are some of the things that I know what does it do. I just want to make sure that the whole algorithm works. So here, the proof is by induction on k. So k would be the parameter that we are. So the number of times the loop is executed. So essentially here we say that if we generally that's the typical things. If the loop is repeated k times, that k is the parameter that we want to do it. We want to say that if it was correct up to k, now if you are running it k plus one, also it is. Okay. So uh, what is the loop invariant or induction hypothesis that we want to, let me clear everything. So this is the induction hypothesis that we want to prove. IH means induction hypothesis. One. So say if is if and this is the thing that we want to prove it after each loop, if m is an integer represented by the binary array b1 to bk, good. So b1 to bk is just some. So again, b1 means the least significant, b2 means the second least significant, and so on. So. That that is a binary number that m is that number, good. Then at any time we have these equations n is equal to t times two to the k plus m. Good, so m is, the, so bk is some partial thing so far. This vector, say, this, this vector represents some binary number, uh, some number, that is m. I want to say that any times I have this equation, n equal to t times two to the k plus m. Now I want to say that, uh, Uh, so 
and what does it say? So essentially, it says this one. If you want to construct N, so what is the intuition behind it? Then that if you want to construct N, M is the least significant number up to K bits that we can get it there. Then N is equal to those guys plus T, but T should be shifted K times because T is the power of two to the K. These are the parts that we didn't yet get into that. So T times two to the K plus M is equal to N. That's a very, I mean, just intuitive things. And we want to just prove it. So, good. So that's the induction hypothesis. Uh, let me just put in this one. Good. Now, to prove the correctness of these things, to, to prove the correctness of the algorithm, we need to prove this one. So the hypothesis is true at all at the beginning. This is the basis of induction. So we want to say that if it is true for at a step k, then it is also true at a step k, k plus one. That's the induction hypothesis that we need to prove it. And we want to say that when the loop terminates, then induction hypothesis gives the correct solution. This gives the correctness of the algorithm. So let's start with one and three, essentially. First, one and, one and three are very easy. So what is the basis of induction? If it's k equal to zero and m equal to zero, so if we, like, if we have not done anything. So in that case, it is n is equal to t. Why n is equal to t? Because, uh, I mean, as we have seen it here, but this is by definition. So when k is equal to zero and, I mean, k is equal to zero and m equal to zero because there is no bit, t is equal to n. So we have that one, the basis of induction. Now let's go back for the... Uh, this one, good. Now, what about for three? Three is also easy. So if, uh, now, if t, be, at the end of the algorithm, we are doing that, the while loop is going until t becomes zero. If t becomes zero, then by induction hypothesis, we know that n is equal to zero times two to the k plus m. And zero two to the k would be zero, would be M. What is M is the binary representation that we are representing with BK. That's exactly the one that we want to prove. Good. So that's also easy essentially to see. Now, finally, we are, uh, let me just, so, the, so essentially we said that at the beginning, we are good. At the end, if we have this induction hypothesis, we are fine. No, only thing is that prove from, uh, go from K to K plus one. And let me just do this one as well. And I think we are, so that would be easy. Now for, uh, let's finish this one. No, uh, for two, we, this is the induction hypothesis. Now say for two, we consider two cases for the start of the case loop. Then we try to case. Loop. If T is an even number, T mod two would be zero, correct? T is the remaining bits that are. If T mod two is equal to zero, so there is no change to the array because uh, this, this is the least significant why we can just put uh, essentially zero there. So T is just divided by two and K is incremented. So in that case, so what do we do? N is equal to T over two, two to the K plus one plus M. So in that case, M will, so because M, uh, when we add one bit at the end, so that's the time, if that bit is zero, that does not change M. Correct. If you are considering some binary representation, you will add something here, zero, that does not change it. That's the case that happens. So M does not change. T be becomes divided by two and K go from K plus one. So this is essentially is equal to T times two to the K over M, which was by induction hypothesis was correct. And the last case, I mean, we are done after that. If T is equal, if T is odd, then B of K plus one is set to one because T mod two would be two, it would be one. So here in this case, we, uh, what it contributes two to the K to the M, because when you put the last digit bit equal to one, so if you are essentially having this uh, like one, zero, one, one, this is the case that we are adding one, one here. 
This one here, the value of this would be two to the K. So we are adding two to the K to the M in this case. So in this case, T changed to T minus one over two, that is the division, and K is incremented by one. So what do we have it? So this new number that we have it would be this. N is equal to T minus one, this number that we have it. T minus one over two, this, we don't know it is equal to N. T minus one over two, times two to the K plus one, plus M, plus this two to the K. Now, I will do this one, two to the K, this cancel out with this one. So it would be T to the, T minus one to the two to the K, plus M, plus two to the K, correct? But again, this two to the K can cancel out this minus one here. It becomes T times two to the K plus M that by induction hypothesis was equal to M. Yes. Uh, uh, good. So uh, yeah, so I, in that case we are, Done because we have just the, what are the changes that have been done? We knew that before it was equal to uh, this number m plus uh, two to the k times t was equal to m, and essentially we kept the same number, so that is correct, and we are done. So you can read some common errors that it avoids it, that happens in induction in the section two point three of the book. This is very important. Please read them, and then we will continue next time. Let me just stop here. Okay, so we are ending the recording and for now, for everyone.